And so, we return to the fold with Unit 2 of Macroeconomics, also called Economic Indicators. And we return more funky fresh than ever to discuss Unit Dose of Macroeconomics. We begin with looking at the circular flow model, which is majestically simple. It essentially represents this concept that the resource market and the product market need firms and businesses to actually make money. So for example, if you, a household, were to provide your land labor capital entrepreneurial ability to a resource market, let's say like a lumber yard, and you know, you're working there, you're producing lumber, that kind of stuff, they pay your wages, that's the money going back, then the lumber itself is sold to a company, a firm, like Home Depot Corporate. In exchange, the lumber, for the lumber, the corporation gives the money to the resource market. Then the firm sends it to a product market, would be like the physical store where the lumber is actually purchased when we are running in terror from a hurricane, for example. Therein, you will also buy that lumber from the product market to build stuff. So essentially, money is always going one way and a good or service is going the other way. It's kind of simple. The government's in the middle, let's not forget, always sucking us dry with taxes, providing either welfare or subsidies, which is just code for welfare to corporations. Common leakages would be uh, net exports, excuse me, exports, or perhaps savings, you know, those coins in your sofa. Something to consider in Unit 2 is also this concept of GDP, something new for this year. We're calculating GDP three different ways now. Originally, there was such a strong emphasis on the expenditure equation, and I believe there still will be, which is consumption plus investment plus government resources plus, you heard it right, net exports. The other two options would be the income approach and the value added approach. So watch out for these two. Income is just wages plus rent plus profit. That essentially just means anytime somebody's making money, you add it all together, that's GDP. The third option is value added, which would be the cost of everything when it's a final product minus input costs. So you're really trying to ascertain what everybody's adding to the product when they finally sell it. These calculations fail to account for a few things. This is why GDP is fundamentally flawed as a metric of development. They don't really tell us about non-market transactions, black market transactions. They don't tell us about the wealth gap. We could have the richest person in the world, hashtag Jeff Bezos, but also no middle class, so that would be a problem. They also don't tell us about the quality of individual products or the healthcare system. Poverty is kind of a complicated thing, if you know what I mean. Something also that's really important for this chapter is this weird little infographic I've given you here. It tells us that a nominal product is essentially a real value plus inflation. So those prices you see at the store are nominal and they have inflation built into them. And part of the task of this chapter, the thing that kind of makes kids stressed out is trying to figure out how to deflate products. More on that in just a second. Moving on is em employment, or unemployment as the case may be, which is just this concept of trying to figure out a percentage of the labor force that is not working. So you take everybody who's looking and you divide it by the labor force, everybody who can work or is working. The labor force participation rate, the plot thickens, is the percent of adults that are working or want to work. So they're not exactly working right now, but they're in the process of looking or, or they're eligible to and they're actually putting themselves out there. This calculation is people looking plus employed over all adults. That's going to be people over 16. The problem with employment is that it doesn't really account for discouraged workers. Once they leave, they're not even in the labor force. So if you just give up and aren't looking whatsoever, the unemployment rate might actually fall? <laughs> Question mark. Really bizarre and super kind of interesting. It also, part-time people are counted as employed, uh, but they might have terrible jobs. And then finally, you have people with PhDs that are working in jobs that are definitely not of the same caliber, so they would be underemployed. We move on to inflation, which is the part of this chapter where kids usually start to say, what the heck did I sign up for? This isn't a math class, but it kind of is. It's kind of a science. It's kind of life. And here's where it gets interesting. We get CPI and the GDP deflator. CPI is a measurement of inflation in a basket of goods. So not everything ever, just a few items every year, and the prices as they change over time. This is usually given to us as a number between 100 to 200. So if it's 110, for example, that would be 10% inflation on this basket of goods. The GDP deflator is the exact same concept, but it's inflation in GDP throughout the entire economy. So they both measure inflation, typically units of 100 to 200 to make math easier. However, the GDP deflator is for all GDP, and CPI is for a little basket of goods. It's super fun. 
they fail to account for the substitution bias. This idea that when prices rise, you're just going to go buy something else that's cheaper or generic or perhaps just gives you more joy. You know, and also quality. We don't know that those, that gallon of milk is the same gallon of milk because that would be impossible. <laughs> Where this gets kind of funky is they'll give you some numbers occasionally, and I went with some really basic numbers so that you could feel perhaps warm and invited instead of intimidated and terrified by my really awkward shirt. Essentially, <laughs> we have two products, figs and pigs for some reason. This is a weird market. And in 2019, a fig cost $10, and in 2020, it cost 12 So you kind of see the pattern here, and pigs 20 to 24 So what I'm trying to show you here is that this is 20% inflation, assuming you're buying the same quantity of pigs. That's an important thing to note. And, you know, the math is usually pretty simple. Here you would just take 2 over 10, and that's 20%. Or you could add them all up and then divide the change over the base number not a big deal. Over here, and finally, we have the business cycle, which you don't really do anything with. So in some ways, it's kind of like the mayonnaise, and now that's a terrible example. It's like the calculus. No, no, no. I'm going to need to reflect on this one. Okay, I got it. Ah. In some ways, it's like the roundabout of the United States civilization. You look at it, you say, hey, that's a roundabout, and then you just do whatever you want. I don't actually believe that, for the record. This graph, not really a graph, more like a representation, uh, depicts real GDP on the vertical axis, that's without inflation, and time, and you can kind of see that generally we're trending up. GDP has risen in the United States over time. And the concept of a peak and a trough, anytime we go up, it's a peak, it's an expansion. And anytime we go down, it's a trough, is this idea that naturally we're cyclically going in and out of recessionary and expansionary gaps. Nothing too wild and crazy. Uh, the concept is essentially, you know, right in the middle is, is the natural rate of unemployment. It's frictional and structural unemployment. Those two things added are the natural rate of unemployment. And then any time we're above this or below this, we have a cyclical change in the economy that's going to be nominal or short-run in nature. And so we're generally trending upward, but we're going to have some, you know, roller coaster-like experiences. So with that being said, I hope you have a magnificent Tuesday, and uh, perhaps I'll see you on that wiggity whack Wednesday. Hashtag hump day. At symbol camels?